Mm -hmm. All right, well, we're here at 141. We've got about 10 minutes. I'm going to say a few news things. Um, this one, there was, oh, I should mute people. Um, okay. So let me turn this down a bit. All right. So um, there was a thing that came out last week about Android and iOS apps keeping screenshots of what you do. And as far as I can tell, that was pretty much nonsense. Um, I tried to test apps to see that, and it seemed to me like that feature was not turned on very often. But this one is apparently on all the time. And this is a similar thing happened with um, Apple iOS apps a few years ago in the time of Weave. There's an ID, a unique ID, that they're not supposed to be sending the app developers. And apparently, many of them are doing that, which in principle means the app developer can track you in much more detail and they're claiming that people are really doing this and it violates uh, the rules. So we'll see what comes of all this. Um, I'm not quite sure what to make of it. I know the uh, unique online identifier of people on the web is a really big deal. Putin wanted this to end anonymity on the web. And uh, if they could get a unique identifier of your phone, it would be a start. So this is uh, Matthew Green, a cryptographer, very famous guy. And he's talking about the Australian government. They just got hacked. Um, by a major political actor. So they claim all their um, political parties have been hacked by a state actor. The details should be coming out. So we'll see what comes of that. Um, Firebox is going to offer fingerprinting and crypto mining protection. The fingerprinting is a new privacy feature to limit those unique identifiers that go back to the advertisers. Um, the non uh, Internet Explorer tried this. They tried honoring the do not track bit and only letting you get ads if they are um, explicitly allowed. And Google specifically ignored that, and I think got away with it when they were sued on the grounds that the whole internet couldn't be paid for if people actually had to give consent to be tracked and have targeted ads. But anyway, they're going to try and increase the um, blocking of tracking in Firefox and the blocking of crypto mining. I'm not sure about the tracking, but the crypto mining seems like a very good idea. It seems like it really would be very easy to notice in your browser if some process is using up too much CPU or something and then block it and pop up a box. So it's a good idea if they have some of that, I think. Yeah. So how would it be able to tell the difference between something that's using a bunch of CPU crypto mining versus like running a game or running an animation? It's a very good question. I mean, my first thought is I would just pop up a box and ask the user. This thing has been using 100 CPU for more than 30 seconds. Is it, you really want me to do this or not? But I mean, they might have something smarter than that. Yeah, hey there. Anyway, so this is this guy, this is the French hacker I've been following. He's the guy that did um, an iOS, uh, Android project that I had here where you uh, hacked into the Indian national app and took away the protection that stops it from running on rooted phones. And a person told him, he had a tweet uh, last week saying there was a big Indian data breach. And I thought, he was breaching India, and I was surprised he could do that, but apparently it wasn't him, it was somebody else, although he certainly goes pretty far. Somebody found the Indian endpoint that leaks the Adhar number, and uh, so he managed to find it, and he found, um, but it does sound like he downloaded a vast amount of the database, which is the kind of thing I would not do, because many ethical hackers I know found a database, and then they downloaded all the database, and then they contacted the company, and then you're in a world of trouble, because now you really are a breach. Um, so. Anyway, he seems to feel invulnerable in France, and maybe he is invulnerable by the laws of France, but he did download a lot of the data, several million records. And so uh, this is a big deal. I think everyone's forced to use this app in India for government purposes. All right. And so this one here, um, there's e-voting code. The Swiss voting agency has released their code for bug bounty examination. And it's very interesting. It's being used in real elections. And so he's hunting through here trying to... Um, see if things are wrong with it, and talking about it. And the main thing he concludes is it's all very, very bafflingly complicated and probably not very secure. Um, and we'll talk about this tonight. This is actually a really repeating thing in IT standards, and especially in cryptography, is that people make a standard that is just mind-boggling, and no one can understand it, nobody can program it, and uh, they make them unnecessarily complicated. They tend to be written by top-level academics, and then when ordinary engineers try to implement them, they can't figure out what's going on and get it wrong. Anyway, so Splunk has decided that they are not going to preserve Russia at all. Not going to give them any updates, not going to give them any software. And I wonder what led to this. I thought 
right now, Russia was politically desirable in America. I, there's probably a story behind this. I like here, you know, I would have expected them to do this against maybe China or something, but deciding that they hate Russia at this very moment is a little strange. So uh, I hope somebody explains exactly what's going on here. Um, so one of the Ethereum developers just rage quit. And the issue is the same thing I've seen many times in the cryptocurrency communities. There is so much money and there are so many new products all the time that they keep on claiming that you're disloyal because you have invested in that other startup that's competing with us and you're poisoning our discussion to make this one weaker and the other one stronger. And that's what they accuse this guy of. He posted this thing saying that Polkadot delivers what Serenity ought to be. And I really don't understand either of them except they're both proposals to handle the scaling problem of Ethereum, which is the huge problem. Something like Lightning Network. Do you know, do you know them? No, yeah. these, are not. these are some proposals to try to fix the scaling problem, which is crippling Ethereum. And apparently, their huge argument about this, which led to this developer quitting entirely, is, is claiming that he's just putting down the Ethereum scaling solution because he's invested in the other one or something. And they're all screaming and yelling and blaming each other about it. It's a lot of this going on. As far as anybody can tell, there's very little actual accomplishment on the blockchain. There's just a whole lot of people jumping ship from one trendy startup to the next, and on it goes. So uh, Kamala Harris said, you know, we should just be using paper to vote. She's certainly right. All the experts I know say the same thing. They say, don't use computers, <laughs> don't use internet, just use good old paper. <laughs> and so- you find boxes and boxes of missing votes. Yes, then you're down to old fashioned ballot box stuffing and ballot box theft, but in the physical world, we have some experience limiting the harm in the electronic world, not so much. But anyway, um, we'll see what comes of it. But I think she's right about that. Um, Drew Paul is going to have another critical exploit tomorrow. This is the third one. The Drew Paul Geddon 1 and Drew Paul Geddon 2. This is, again, a level 10 highly critical vulnerability. Or, so we have to patch tomorrow. So um, I'm not last red versus blue. I had Drew Paul there. And we'll be starting going through Drew Paul Geddon more. It, Drew Paul is... Uh, certainly having a lot of big problems in the last few years. And there was another one that just came out uh, about cryptocurrency I wanted to mention, but I can't find it now. Anyway, um, I think we're up to close enough to the official time we can just carry on with the chapter, which is pretty interesting stuff this time. So let me close some of this nonsense and Get rid of some of these extra things we don't need. Okay. And I will get to the presentation. All right. Which should be here. Chapter four. Okay. All right. Oh, it really is chapter four. I forgot. It's block ciphers. I got the wrong title on it. Anyway, um, so now we're up to AES. This is probably... Getting right to the center of the course, AES and RSA are the main things you need to know. So we're going to talk about block ciphers. Um, block ciphers have been around for quite a while. DES was the first official federal standard. The development and, and uh, approval of DES is scandalous, and it has all come out that the NSA totally poisoned it in several ways. But anyway, it was the standard until 2005. The KGB has similar block cipher they're still using. And, um, but in 2000, we got AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard, developed to replace AES. And it was developed by two Belgian cryptographers, and they combined their names to make this RIN jail name for it. These are all block ciphers. So a block cipher works like this. You have a block of plain text, typically 8 or 16 bytes, and that is the P, a plain text block. You're trying to create a cipher text block by running it through an encryption function with a key and the plain text, and it combines the key and the plain text in some way and creates a cyber text block. That's, those are the terms. So here's the goal. It should be a pseudo-random permutation, which means the output should look like just random numbers, should not have any patterns left in it that give you any information about the key or the plain text. That's the idea. 64 bits is DES block size and AES is 128. Um, you could choose weird numbers like 96, but these are chosen, chosen to fit in 32 and 64 bit processors to make it efficient. And uh, if you choose anything below 64 bits for the block size, then there's a codebook attack where you just make a charge of all possible input blocks. And since there are not enough combination of input blocks, you can do a brute force attack that way, not on the key. So um, 
That's the code book attack. You encrypt every possible plain text because there are only, if you have 32 bit blocks, there are only two to 32 possible plain texts. So you can just make a code book of them all and they'll look it up in there. Um, all right, so to construct your block cipher, there's two ways to do it. You can do it with substitution permutation or you can do it with Feistel. And we're gonna talk about this, but this is very much like just making hash. You're just trying to take the plain text and cut it up and mix it and cut it up the other way and mix it and cut it up. And so all the bits are just scrambled all over the place at random so nobody can find any patterns left over from the original patterns in the plain text. So you hit, in practice, this is done by rounds. You define one round that transforms it, and then you just repeat that round several times. That's how they actually do it. So if you have a three round block cipher, you have round one on the plain text, and then you take that and do round two on it, take that and do round three on it, and that's the encryption. And to, in order to reverse it, you just run the rounds in the opposite order. And you have some kind of inverse round function, which undoes whatever the round function does. That's the general principle. Now, in, in here we got these round keys. Round one, round two, and round three use the same algorithm, but they have a different key for each round. That's how it's generally done. And so you, yeah, yeah. Is the inverse round the same, or is it just a, like a different algorithm that's related to the initial round? In, for very simple things like XOR, the inverse round is the same, but for most of them, the inverse round is in the opposite series. Your round is something same like, steps, it's the same steps, just backwards. But it has to be whatever reverses it. And that's why everything has to be, there can't be any randomness. Everything has to have a way to reverse it. That's probably why they picked the, 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 the permutations that they picked. So they yes. Picked. Okay. The fundamental transformations we're using are chosen both so they can be reversed and also so that they're fast on the kind of computers you can build. Those are the two main considerations. So um, if you suppose you use the same key over and over again, so all the round keys were the same, um, you could do that. You could do encrypt, 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 encrypt over and over. And if you did, there's an attack called the slide attack. So here, if I have plain text and I give it three rounds and go to cipher text, and then I can have another plain text, if I can find a plain text that matches one round on another plain text, then these two have a mathematical relationship. And so this is the game. If I could find a plain text for P2 is one round transform of P1, then C2 would be one round transformer of C1, and those would help me deduce the key. Now, we're not going into the details of how this attack works, although we're going to do it, when you do the meet in the middle attack, you'll see. But basically, this lets you focus on just one round. Now. You do not really need to solve three rounds. You now can sort of reduce the problem to just one round, and that is usually not strong enough. That's why ciphers have many rounds. In fact, if, in the study of AES, we talked about this before, AES has something like 10 or 14 rounds, and if you take the number down to like six or eight, they can actually crack it. This is usually how you do study the security of these systems is take the number of rounds down to where you can actually solve it, and then try to get a clue of how much more rounds make it stronger, and then you can estimate how strong the current system is compared to one that's crackable. So this kind of slide attack causes you to study a system that has less rounds in it and therefore is weaker. So that's the game here. Um, now the key schedule in AES, by the way, has a feature which it, it could be considered a weakness. It does not um, prevent you from figuring out the main key from an individual round key. That process is reversible. Um, it might be stronger if they used a different key schedule that didn't have that property, but this has not led to any major compromise. But you know, every system has some weaknesses of design, and this is one design feature that does seem not perfect. If, if there was enough motivation to make a new AES, they might try to make something without this, this potential weakness. Um, one thing about it though, is you can use electromagnetic emanations because the only thing you can find by watching how it actually calculates the round is of course the round key. And if you could get the round key from the electronic emanations, that's enough to get the real key in AES. And if this key schedule problem were fixed, it would not be. So question. Yeah. With hash functions, it's easy to do one way, hard to do the other. That's the idea. Why don't they just take the first two keys and do some kind of hashing function that is hard in one way, easy one way, hard the other? Exactly. The final key. No, I think that's exactly the point. In retrospect, they should have used a hash function or something to make the round keys, but it became the standard without doing that. Well, what does yeah. the expansion do to the key? 
Oh, it does something extremely simple, like just take a few bucks and move them over and XOR them or something. Oh, it's a very power. simple transformation to make the round keys. The round keys are just slightly modified from each key. The which they, is known. That's the point. Yeah, not only, not only is it known, but it's also very simple and easily reversed because they seem good enough. And you'll see a lot of crypto systems, especially next time, are all very simple, just amazingly simple because they appear to be strong enough. Like RC4 is just unbelievably simple. You don't even do XR or anything. You just take some bytes and rearrange them. It's, it's amazing how even the simplest transformation turns out to be relatively strong cryptographically. And of course, then it's much faster and cheaper to use. You really don't have to do a lot of extra calculations. So there's pressure. You know, you're trying to make something that can be used commercially. So you want to be able to take something like internet traffic, gigabits per second, and encrypt it on the fly without slowing things down, even on old machines from like the 70s. So you got a lot of pressure to not get too fancy. Anyway, so substitution permutation is the way that AES does it. And so you're trying to achieve these two cryptographic properties of confusion and diffusion. Confusion means that uh, the output does not depend on patterns in the key. So many key bits contribute to each bit in the output. And diffusion means that every bit in the output depends on many bits in the input. So basically, confusion means that that you can't deduce something about the key by looking at the plain text, and diffusion means you can't deduce something about the plain text by looking at the ciphertext. Those are the two things you would like. Um, you'd like, basically, you'd like any changing any one bit in the key or changing any one bit in the plain text to change all the bits in a random way in the output. That would be the most perfect confusion and diffusion situation. So the Feistel scheme is another way to do it, and this is what DES used. You take the plain text and split it into two halves, then you take one half, encrypt it, and XOR it with the first, and then flip the two bits. So you only encrypt half the bits in every round, and then you interchange the two rounds and encrypt it again. So if you do eight rounds, you encrypt the each block only four times, but you flip them back and forth and XOR them with each other to scramble them together. Uh, this is how DES does it, 16 rounds of Feistel. All right, so I got a few cahoots about this stuff. Let me bring them up. It reminds me of something that uh, Einstein said about physics. He said, you have to have an a theory that is as simple as possible, but no simpler. And what you're trying to do is find the minimum amount of work required to really scramble something. I'm going to need a place to record winners. Yes. Well, we got the amazing. Well, we haven't got it. We're well. Uh, right there. Oh, oh, yes, but I mean, yeah, you know, I was thinking. Uh, from our fearless leader, it's not clear whether we already have it or we need to have it, or somehow both are true. It is an emergency. That much appears to be true. Yes, it's an emergency. Hey there. Yeah. What's up? Yeah, I'll be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's up? Next, take him down there. Yeah, someone like a Oh, yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> oh, there you go. Right. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I better if they even collect the money. All right, well, I'm going to start this. All right. All right. So, what are the rounds of AES?
exactly. They are substitution and permutation. Feistel is DES. All right. What attack crack ciphers with small block sizes? Okay, that's the codebook attack. You can enumerate all possible plain texts. All right. Which one attacks ciphers with fixed round keys? That's the slide attack. All right. And what kind of rounds encrypt only half the plain text? That's Feistel. Good. All right. So the winners are real names. Good. Or names I know anyway. All right. I can't spell, but I know them. Um, TB and M H I N O J. Good. All right. Those are names I work with. And by the way, it reminds me, in case any of you didn't notice, we're going to the regionals of CCDC. We barely made it, but we made it. So that's a big step. So in a couple of weeks, they'll be down in Southern California doing that. Well, I'm at B-Sides, but anyway, uh, the team just did very well and so did their coach, Elizabeth. So congratulations. Anyway. Um, all right. So let's talk about AES. Um, DES started with a 56-bit key. It was originally an IBM system with 128-bit keys, and the NSA lowered it to 56, so they could crack it even back in the 70s. Um, in 1997, a public um, group of servers cracked it, taking three months using thousands of Linux servers by brute force, and after that, the uh, EFF in San Francisco made a special device that could crack it in like three days by brute force, proving that two to the 56 is just really not enough. That was deep crack, yeah, yeah. They made special deep crack chips and they made a board with many of these identical deep crack chips and that was able to try two to 56 keys in like three days. So that was, so desk was really ruined at that point where you could prove that you didn't need to be a, very rich to crack desk. So the solution, the temporary stock act was triple desk. Triple desk was designed to be stronger and also to be easily compatible with single desk. This is the same thing you see in Microsoft Domain Controllers. When you install a Microsoft Domain Controller, it will ask you, do you want to make a native domain controller, where if you're putting on, say, Server 2016, all your other domain controllers must be Server 2016, or do you want a backward-compatible domain controller so you can use your Windows 2000 domain controllers with this? And they tell you, if you use the backward-compatible one, then it will integrate with your existing stuff, but the security will be much less because it has to use the old versions of stuff from the older system. And it's the same thing here. If you, if, so if you're a bank and you have all this desk stuff and then you buy the triple desk stuff, there's a period of time when you want to be rolling in the new stuff and having it interoperating with the old stuff. So the fact that triple desk can easily continue to speak single desk is something desirable in business to get you through the transition as you get rid of your old generation of stuff before you're ready to switch it all to triple desk. That's the idea. But triple desk is, although it's considered completely strong and safe to use, it's slower than AES because it was actually designed for hardware, not for software. And so AES since 2000 has been the NIST standard. And um, there's a nice video showing how it works, which I'll play. There used to be a flash animation, but of course flash has gone the way of the dodo bird. So somebody be, um, put it on YouTube, which is better for modern audiences. And that's what we got here. So. Uh, this is the, um, I didn't want that. I want to go to the beginning. Go to the beginning, I say, and then get big. There we are. So this is the Rin Jail Cipher. And um, it's just going to show you there are, these are the steps. So in comes plain text at the top. You've got a key coming in the left and cipher text comes out the bottom. So it has an internal state, which is 16 bytes. and has a key, which is 16 bytes. This is the most common type, AES-128. And so you have feed in the cipher key, and that goes to the key schedule, which is going to create all these round keys, and the state is going to be used in the encryption process. So it'll come up here. We got um, nine rounds, and then the final round's a little different. Okay, so there you add the round key. There's the four steps. Substitute, shift, mix, and add a round key. You do that nine times, and the last time you skip one of the steps, and that's the process, 10 rounds. So here's the transformations. All right. 
So substitute bytes, you take the bytes and you look them up. The left four bits give you a number, the right four bits give you a number, you just look them up in this table and transform. This will just substitute those bytes with other bytes according to this S box. And the S box is generated by certain numbers. Then you shift rows to try to break vertical stripes that might be there. You rotate it this way to smear out the vertical stripes, just like you would do if you were making hash. Cut it this way and cut it the other way. And to break the um, horizontal stripes, you run it through a matrix, which does the same kind of thing in the other dimension. You take that and multiply each of these by a matrix, which mixes them vertically. So any patterns, horizontal patterns or vertical patterns, are smeared out. And then you add a key, the round key. This is the thing that comes from the key schedule to make sure that every round is different. You just add it in. Um, which I think they add with XOR. It might just be straight addition. I'm not quite sure. Anyway, yes. it's XOR. Yes. Well, it's a type of it. Yes, yeah, it's, it's XOR. Right. So then you've done that. Now you do the same thing nine more times with the keys that come from the key schedule. And the last round, you skip one step, which I never knew why until I read in your textbook. They skip the last step because they prove it doesn't actually make it any more mathematically secure. But it would be trivial to undo the last step, so it's a waste of time. So that's why they skip a step. And so that's the game. Um, and that's your output. And I think that's all worth seeing here, but then I've already explained how the key schedule works. And we were talking about this, so maybe it's worth seeing a little more about how they make the key schedule work. So you start with the key, and then you rotate some words and substitute bytes transformations to the key. Looks like you use the same transformations you use elsewhere to, to make the sub round keys. All right. And I think that's enough of that. I guess the main point. All right. So um, let's go back to here. That's, that's the general idea how it works. And yeah, here's the internal state. You just a four by four array of 16 bytes. So it's got an internal state. This is also we're going to see true of SHA-1. It has an internal state which remembers where it is. And so you go through these steps, as we talked about, these four steps, and you do it for several rounds. And here's each of these operations is carefully chosen to block a certain attack. I was sort of surprised when WEP came out and WEP was patched to create WPA. They just found the four mistakes in WEP and they put a little Band-Aid over each mistake. And that is how this thing is designed. In order to try to solve the problem of what is the least amount of work to really scramble something, they've considered what attacks are possible and they've carefully put something to stop each attack. So key expansion, make sure the key is different in every round so you can't do the slide attack. If you didn't add the round key to every round, then the rounds would not depend on the key and that wouldn't hide it at all. You have to subtract bytes or substitute bytes to be a nonlinear operation so you can't solve it analytically. And this substituting by just looking things up in that lookup table is a nonlinear operation. Shift rows will scramble across the columns and mixed columns will scramble across the rows. So it's in general not too hard to see how this just really mixes up the bits to create confusion and diffusion. And so you can play with it in Python and let me set this up. I've got this here, so I can copy and paste it. Now let me start with this much of it. There. All right, so this, this is why we're going to use Python a lot in this class, because Python does all the work for us. And um, I'm using Python 2.7 because it's simpler. So if I want to do AES, I just import AES from Crypto Cypher. So here's my plain text. I have to have 16 bytes, so I started this phrase, dead men tell no. The key has to also be 16 bytes, so I just used 4As, 4Bs, 4Cs, and 4Ds. Doesn't matter what they are. Now I create a new AES object based on the key. And now I give that a name cipher, and then I run the encrypt method to encrypt the plain text, and it turns it into this unprintable garbage. It is um, normal because this creates binary output, which is probably not printable. So if I want to see the uh, data, I'll probably encode it with hex. And now I've got the hexadecimal output, which is the easiest way to write binary. That blob of 16 bytes of hexadecimal is the encrypted data 
that encrypts the 16 data text. And if I want to, I can um, decrypt it. Up here, I did encrypt. I can print, for example, instead of putting in a variable, I can print this and I can decrypt it, the ciphertext. And now I get back to the original data. So this is the point of the thing, of course, I can feed in a block of text, I can encrypt it to this junk that nobody else can read, and I can decrypt it, and nobody can get it without knowing my secret key. I have to keep the key secret. This is, by the way, ECB mode, which is the default, which is the simplest, called textbook encryption, which we're gonna throw mud on a little later. But this is the simplest form of encryption. All right, so if you wanna implement this, um, it turns out, of course, if you are a good programmer, you wanna make things fast. So when you implement it, there are two ways to do it. One is with table-based implementations, and the other was native instructions. Um, you could make a function that does the substituting bytes and does the shift row and does the mixed column and then call for functions for every round. And that would get you to the end, but that would be really slow because it wouldn't take advantage of any shortcuts if opportunities occur to skip some steps. And so OpenSSL is table-based. They found each one of those rounds and they found that they couldn't combine it into one operation where you do shift something to write 24 bits and then 16 bits and eight bits and four bits to pick off the things and then XOR them together. They just found a way to combine all four operations into a few simple mathematical functions all at once to make it faster. Um, that's what you do if you're a smart programmer is you find a way to make a mathematically equivalent operation that is faster in the processor. And that was their goal here. But the problem is that means since it's taking all possible shortcuts, that if a situation would occur that makes it faster, like you have a bunch of zeros in the key or something, it will be faster for that reason. And that means you can deduce something about the key from how long the encryption took. That's a timing attack side channel. The math does not say anything about the time because it doesn't talk about the implementation, but the real implementation has these side channels like the radio emitted and the time consumed. And if you are an efficient programmer of any kind, then you create timing vulnerabilities because you skip steps that are a waste of time. Like I'm multiplying by zero, then I multiply the next bit, which is also zero, multiplies on by the next bit. I skip all those because they're all zero. That means I'm leaking timing information. This seems to be a fundamental logical problem. You either waste time or you leak information based on how long it took. Yeah. Leakage of information through timing. Yeah. Is the timing differences in like microseconds, picoseconds, nanoseconds? Uh, in clock cycles, if an air processor and in modern clock cycles, it's um, nanoseconds. And so it, you might think you couldn't measure those, but in fact, you can because. It, now, in order for a timing attack to work, you have to have something like the ability to do something a million times and the ability to get fast, accurate transmissions. So it's all going to work a lot better if you can actually run code on the same box. If you want to do it over the network, then you have network latency that will get in the way. But um, so that's that issue, these timing attacks. And most SS, uh, HTTPS attacks require you to do something like if you can do the same thing a billion times, then you can get some information. Box. Yeah, on that box. That's why, you know, they're pretty impractical, but they worry people because you'd like to say it's absolutely ironclad and um, you're going to put military secrets on it and stuff. And so people want to say, what is the weakness? And that's the weakness. But could that be applicable to like a hardware device? Yeah, also do a hardware device in principle. Yeah, depending if it has an algorithm, it's efficient. So uh, the other way they do it is they just put it all in the, in the um, chip. So you don't program it at all. The chip designer does it in the silicon. This is the modern solution. Intel has an AES implementation. And this apparently solves the timing attack, although one thing I do not really know is why isn't the hardware-based solution also susceptible to timing? But it probably is that the hardware implementation cannot skip any steps. It just has to flow down the groove. So it is probably not optimized the same way, but I'm just making that up. I don't really know. Your book says the hardware implementation solved the timing attack, and they want it. you don't even try to code AES at all. It's built in the processor and it provides you with AES assembly language instructions. And here they are, you have a bunch of registers, XMM up to 15, and you just put in the round keys in the XMM, the plain text in one of them, and you call the AES encrypt and it does it for you, all on the chip. Which is of course, it's extremely popular. Everybody uses AES for everything. You do want it right there. And this outsources the coding to the developer of your processor. And of course, it's much faster and probably much more reliable. You don't have a chance to make a mistake implementing it either. 
So that's the game. And so then the question is, how secure is AES? And the answer is AES-128 is extremely secure. We've been using it for 15 years. Cryptographers have been attacking it with all their might. And the only thing anybody found was an attack that breaks it to the extent that instead of taking two to the 128 guesses, you only need to do two to the 126 guesses, which is not much of a break. Technically, four times faster than brute force, but that's amazingly good because that's totally out of range. Anything above 100 bits is just hopelessly out of range. The biggest brute force attack that's ever been done is, I think, 64 bits, and 72 is underway and expected to take 1,000 years. So 100 bits, 2 to 100 is a plenty big enough number that nobody's ever getting in there. But, of course, who can predict the future? Um, the, yeah. Native assembly instructions. Yeah. It still uses memory to store the intermediate results on the chip in the registers or something yeah on the not microprocessor yeah not not ram but just registers on the chip got it so that's less susceptible to the kind of attacks you did in 127 is what you're saying um that is not the attack that gets you down from 2 to 128 two, that would be a side channel attack if it has anything to do with physical implementation the attack against aes that i know about is a mathematical attack there is an algorithm that can find the key in only two to the 126 operations instead of 128 in the textbook that that attack requires a massive amount of plain text. That's right. And, That's right. It requires something like two to the 80 plain text or something. So it's totally impractical. Yeah. So like at that point, you already have the plain text. Yeah. So I mean, it, it turned, so what I was saying is no attack that's even remotely practical has been found that does any amount of speed up on 128. And there's no way to read memory when capturing an intermediate. Uh, yes, there totally is. If you're allowed to like stick a probe into the processor and steal the half computed stuff, then you can totally break it. That's a side channel attack. And there are a bunch of those. In fact, there was one that came out a while ago that broke RSA by just lowering the power on the motherboard. So the processor started making mistakes. And their point there was that the cosmic rays now are powerful enough and modern processors are so dense that it is relatively common that your processor drops a bit now because a cosmic ray hits it and causes electrons to move. And therefore, if you have a server pumping out encrypted stuff all day long, some of them actually have mistakes of one bit. And if you flip one bit during calculation, that has a non-random result. And so they were able to do like, uh, I think a thousand encryptions and collect 100 encryptions of the same thing that had dropped a bit. And from those hundred bits, they were able to, hundred broken encryptions, they were able to deduce the key. Oh, because they know that like when this specific bit was changed, it the yes, dropping one bit during the calculation has, and then you know you know the right answer, and you know the error caused by dropping one bit. You can deduce something about the key from that. You basically oh, you encrypt the same thing over and over. Yes, you encrypt the same thing over and over, and you get most of them are right, and you get the few that are wrong, and you figure out what would happen. Where you you figure out all the places you could flip one bit, and which one, and you can deduce with only a hundred samples what the key is. So, I mean, that's a side channel attack. And that's the problem. I mean, the math is great, but the math only works if your hardware is perfect. Any defect in your hardware, of course, causes some data to leak out. That means that you have to have access to be able to encrypt on the target machine, but can't access the key. Yes, which is actually quite common. There's a bunch of things like web servers where you send up data, it gets encrypted, and you can see the cyber text machine. It's, there are quite a situation, for example, a, yeah, a web. You can send network packets that then encrypts them. So you can keep sending stuff over and over until they keep encrypting it over and over. And you get a bunch of IDs, and then you can figure it out. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You used to do it all the time. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Anyway, so, um, all right. So then here's the big issue is mode of operation. This is more of it. You have the beautiful mathematical system, which is very well designed. But now, when you try to get down to reality, you hit irritating problems. And here's the irritating problem. Um, in the electronic code book, you encrypt every block exactly the same way. Every plain text gets encrypted with a key. The next plain text is encrypted with the same key. So this means if there were two blocks of plain text that were exactly the same, you'd get two blocks of ciphertext that are exactly the same. And that means um, if the plain text repeats, so does the ciphertext. So if I go back, and I, I guess I can do this right here in my Python, might as well. So if I go back to my plain text here, and I just make it longer. So now it's 16 bytes long, where the second half is the same as the first half. Now I calculate the ciphertext. 
Okay, now the encoding is 8FC9 blah blah and then another 8FC9 blah blah. Of course, the second block just repeats the first block. Same key, same input, same output. That's what they call textbook encryption. This is what most people do if they read a textbook about encryption or math. And that's why people sneer at them because this is not good enough for real security. And obviously you now have some patterns left in the output. So Staples does this. The Staples Android app, one of the many going through in the other class. So Staples stores your password on your phone and it encrypts it and it encrypts it with AES in ECB mode. And I could see that by reading the source code, but even before I got the source code, I was able to find out this way, which is a trick I learned from the Web Application Hacker's Handbook. Just give it a password that is 32 letter A's. Then they had a complexity requirement, so I had to add a one, two, three, and capital at the end to make it pass the complexity requirement. But the first 32 bits of my password were all lowercase a. And that means when it's encrypted, here's the encrypted thing, that string on that Staples stores on your phone, and it doesn't look like it repeats, but that's just because this is base 64. So you're seeing it six bits at a time. If you go reverse the base 64 and print it out here, you can see that there's a 16 byte block and then an identical second 16 byte block. So it's running AES with 16 byte, and then it's running the next 16 bytes, which is also A's, go in and do it again. And the third byte is the remaining characters, one, two, three, capital A. So they are using ECD mode, which is one of the many mistakes Staples make. They make uh, it is, of course, quite common. Yes, that's a big issue. No one should ever use ECB for anything, really, yeah. and people often do. Just like, and every in Android, in my experience, it seems to be like 60% of apps that do appallingly stupid things with encryption. They shouldn't be doing this at all. They shouldn't be using secret key encryption at all to hide a secret on your phone because they have to hide the key somewhere. There's a key distribution problem. If they wanted to do this, they should be using public key encryption. And they should be scrambling your password with a public key, which can be put on the phone and lost and it's harmless. And then the private key lives on their server. So you send that encrypted junk up to the server and they can read it and nobody else can read it. This solution has been around since 1979, but the developers don't understand it. And they use private key encryption instead for no good reason at all. Go ahead. Yeah. Import statement with a base 64. Yeah. What is, is it? What is it? Is it import base 64? Yes. Uh, I think it was, yeah, I had to import base64 for that one. And later on, I learned you don't even need to. You can just do dot encode base64 and dot decode base64 in Python 2. But yeah, before that, I didn't know that, and I'd import this base64 library that does it. There are many ways to do the same thing in Python, of course. Anyway, so this means if you have an image, you can encrypt it, and that's what you get. It, it, the blocks of gray all turn into green, the blocks of black all turn into whatever that sick pinkish color is and so on. You still can see the image. You've lost some of the resolution, of course, because the borders got encrypted, but the blocks of solid color just turned into different solid colors. And so that is like, seriously, not what you want when you encrypt something. You want all the data to be hidden so people can't see it. And this emphatically does not achieve that goal. So it fails to have, I think, diffusion. Was it conf confusion? Anyway, it fails to scramble things so you can't see the plain text anymore. Even if you don't have the key, you can still see the plain message there. <laughs> yeah, there's information in the cipher. You can still see the information. Yeah. Is it not entropy? Is it uh, entropy? Like it, high entropy or low entropy? Um, low entropy, entropy is another issue here, but it doesn't have confusion, I think. No, diffusion. It doesn't have diffusion. Yeah. Um, so well, it is like that. Yes, it is. A substitution cipher of blocks of plain text to blocks of cipher text. Yeah. If it was letters in the English language, you could do a frequency attack. Yes. And if you, I suppose if you wanted to, you could actually calculate the frequency of 16 letter groupings in English and do it that way. Yes. In principle, you could. Very, very good point. All right. So the cure is you have to somehow, remember in AES we had to have a different round key for every round, so we have to somehow have something that changes in every round, and this is the most popular solution. This is what everybody really uses. I was very disturbed when I first learned about this, and I later learned I was right to be disturbed, but this is what people use, cipher blockchain. You have a key, and you use the same key in every round, but you also have an initialization vector, the IV comes in, and you XOR the IV with the plain text in the first block, and then you encrypt that. And then you take the output of this as the IV for the next block. 
and take the output of the second block as the IV for the third block. So the result of one computation is used for the next. Now, when I first heard of this, I grew up with carpenters. So I first thought, if you have a board, and you want to hold out a board the same length, you measure the next board from this board, next board from that board, you get accumulated error, and they start getting worse and worse. But of course, the error rate is zero in computation. If you start dropping a bit anywhere, everything is shot anyway. So that's not a problem. But what is a problem here is it means that the output of the next block depends on the previous block. And it looks like that's disturbing. That makes me think that there might be some way to exploit that to determine something about the key. And indeed, there is. Also, by the way, it means you cannot calculate it on a parallel computer. You cannot do block two until you've done block one. You cannot do block three until you've done block two. So the, your, your eight core processor does you no good at all. You have to just do them one at a time, which is a practical, irritating problem. But this is fantastically popular because it does solve the, by the way, the IV means you have two things, the initialization vector and the key, and the um, recipient has to know the key and the IV. So you they can't decrypt it, not really notice. And so in practice, you just send them the IV along with the message in the clear. It's not a secret. The key is the only secret. So this does, however, do that. It means now when you encrypt stuff with CBC, it just turns into snow and gets rid of all the patterns. And this is, of course, why everybody jumped on it and everybody uses it. It solves the huge problem with textbook encryption. Now, all the patterns in the input are scrambled totally and you can't see the penguin anymore. So that's certainly a lot better than ECB mode. All right. So you can choose an IV. Now, if you use the same IV for many messages, then the first block would always be encrypted the same. And so you could just take the first block and um, look for patterns in the first block. And if there were any two inputs with the same first block, you'd see that. So that's a weakness. So your spoof should not repeat using the IV. You have different IV for every message or you will have a potential smaller degree of patterns in the output that could be used to learn something. Um, and like I mentioned, parallelism is shot. Nowadays, everybody has multi-core processors. And in this mode, your multi-core processor is no use at all. You have to do it in step by step. How many uh, bytes in the IV? 16 bytes, just like the, just like the block size. And it doesn't necessarily have to come from a random number generator. Just nope, it just has to be different every time. You could even take one, two, three, four, or five and count up, and that would be all right. Yeah. It just has to be different. All right. So now here's another problem, which is going to turn out to be the end of the world. So let's go back to our real example here. So I have my plain text, dead men tell no. Now, if I do that, and then I encrypt that, which is this, and then I print the output. Okay. So I'm back to my block of output. But suppose I want to finish this and say dead men tell no tales. Now if I now I try to encrypt it and I get an error. You cannot encrypt something that is not 16 or 32 bytes. You can't. It's a block cipher. It only encrypts blocks of 16 and they're not kidding. If I have a block of 16 plus four more, it quits. It dies. So you have to fill up the missing bytes with something. This would seem like a minor problem, and it is not a minor problem at all. This turns out to be really a big problem. So how do you pad it? This is what almost everybody does. You, if you need one byte of padding, you use zero one. If you need two bytes, you do zero two. If you don't need any padding at all, you put a whole 16 bytes of zero one zero of 16, 16, 16, 16. So this, the reason you do this is you want to make it easy to remove the padding later. So you decrypt it. You look at the last byte, you throw away that many bytes, and now you got the plain text message. And there's no problem of guessing how much of it is real message and how much is padding. This system means you have a very simple way to make sure you get exactly back to the original message. Yes. You now have some known plain text in the message. Yeah. Yes. That is a problem. That turns out to be a very bad problem. You now know that the last byte is always from 0 to 16, 1 to 16 and never anything else. And you know a bunch of other bytes too in the plain text. So, and here's something even worse. Many people produced error messages and they would tell you that the error was a padding error. Not that there was a decryption error, but there was a padding error. You get a little more information because developers don't know all the rules. And that is a side channel. Now I'm getting more information about what went wrong than the designer thought I would get. The designer thought, all your attacker gets is the ciphertext. They don't have to try to find it without the key. But if they get the ciphertext, 
and an error message which tells them if the padding was wrong, that is enough to leak out information about the key in your host. And we're going to play with that. But that's, this is why people, if you actually understand this, you'll be very, very afraid of cryptography because even the simplest design decision that seems harmless could ruin the whole thing. Um, so here's site. So there's an alternative to PKCS number seven to pad. This is a better way to pad, but nobody uses it. What you do is you pad only with zeros. Then you swap the last two bytes of ciphertext and discard extra bytes at the end. So you end up with ciphertext that is exactly as long as the plain text, even when it's not a multiple of 16. And so here's how it works. You encrypt the first block, you take the output and use it as the IV for the next block. And then the output here you use for the next block, but then you go back and do another round of encryption. And you move the last block over and you put the, the in-between block at the end and then you throw away some blocks, some bytes out of the end of that one. And somehow this doesn't lose your ability to reproduce it. This turns out that the blocks you threw away were just going to be the zeros anyway. And uh, this results in something where you don't have those known bytes at the end. You've thrown them away. So you have filled it up and you can use a block cipher, but you've cleaned it up. This is a little hard to understand. And so uh, there's the decryption part. See the part you threw away is the part that was going to be the zeros anyway. Um, but it does involve two rounds of encryption and two rounds of decryption and flipping some bytes around, and it's sort of hard to understand and hard to get straight. And so the end result is, this would be swell, but nobody uses it. Um, it's considered quite good, it solves the problems, but it's very hard for anyone to understand. It's hard to program, people keep getting it wrong, the standard is baffling and confusing, and everybody says, why bother with all that? The other system is good enough. And that's where we are. That's where we are almost everything in security. Something becomes the standard that is pretty good, and later on people have improvements, but nobody cares unless you really have murdered the standard. And then just to confirm that, would you be able to know how much padding it when it's decrypted? Uh, yeah, when you decrypt it, yeah, when you decrypt it, it knows how much padding you throw away. So yeah, yep, yeah, there isn't this problem of going, yeah. Uh, you have a message. I have a message. Oh good, thank you. A message up here. This is the bit I didn't get. Yeah, well, I tried to understand the cybertech stealing myself, and I never quite got it straight. So my hand waving is about as far as I got. Because when I found out that nobody uses it, I decided I don't really care. I, and this is something you'll hear over and over again everywhere in security. There's a system. Then there's a complicated, baffling improvement that supposedly fixes it, but nobody cares. And the longer you've been in this business, the less you care, because usually that baffling improvement, in fact, isn't so great as you think it is. It fixes one problem and often causes another. I, so, uh, you know, this, yeah. Is this sort of similar how they use like identifiers for salt as well? So like if you're known, like when you're decrypting it, like this is where the salt starts. Yeah, salt and a nonce and initialization vector are all the same thing. They're just different terms. It's uh, something added to make something different every time you do it. And so yeah. you call it salt in, in uh, password hashing. They all serve the same purpose. Oh, okay. Yeah. And this is very useful because it's forgotten very often. Microsoft forgot it in Microsoft Office encryption until like 2003 or 2008, I think. So here's another, this is what I think everybody should be using, by the way, talking about baffling improvements. This one's actually easy. This is, I never understood cipher block chaining. I said, that can't be right. That you take the output of one block and put, mix it into the next block. That's got to be horrible. This is what I would like. You just have a counter, 0, 1, 2, and 3. You use that for the IP. <laughs> And this way, now, to be a little bit fancy, instead of just using one, two, three, and four, you choose a random number and then XOR it with that. So you have a series of numbers, but that's what you use for the IV for each block. This Now you can do it in parallel. One block does not depend on the next block. And it, you can predict, this, this seems so much better to me. You just have a different IV for each block in a nice, controlled, clean fashion. And this seems very good, very effective, very fast. I don't know why people didn't settle on this and use it instead of CBC. For some ungodly reason, CBC became popular and this didn't. I would have preferred it the other way. Yeah. Why not make more than just like that and hash the previous IDs and then? Because this seems like it would be vulnerable to email, which means even if it's just. Um, I suppose, but knowing the IV doesn't seem to matter because it gets scrambled enough. Like remember, the IV is going to be sent in plain text anyway. So you know the IV and it doesn't matter. The, the design of the system is the only thing that has to be secret is the key. Knowing the IV doesn't matter. That's the plan. 
But yeah, it's a good. So here's so here's counter mode. You have counter one, C one, C two, C three. Let's be a C three at the end there. Let me just fix it here. Um, that's very rude. It should be. Come on, I'd fix it if I could get in there. There we are. C three, of course. There. All right. So you encrypt each one with the same key, but just the counter number changes, and now you create a pseudo random byte stream. And this, notice the plain text is nowhere here. You're gonna just XOR the box of plain text with this. So one thing that's awesome about counter mode is you've taken a block cipher and turned it into a stream cipher. You just have a pseudo random stream down here like you might have with a one-time pad. And now you just XOR that with your plain text. So it's very nice. And the way you produce it is you take a nonce and just take nonce XOR one, nonce XOR two, nonce XOR three. That's how you create all those C3s. Use a different nonce for each message and you said the nonce in the clear. And so there's no padding. You create a byte bit stream and you can use it to encrypt as many bits as you want and then stop. It doesn't matter, it's like a stream cipher. So very nice, it's also parallelized of course. Each block is completely independent of the rest. You could have multiple cores doing it and it would be just fine. You do not need to do the first block before you do the next block. So uh, this is pretty awesome. It's faster than any other mode. As far as anybody knows, perfectly fine. I don't know why CBC continues with all its problems, but it's become the standard, so we're stuck with it. So, you talk about how things go wrong. And there are two major attacks that are important here. There's meet in the middle and the padding oracle. Meet in the middle is why we have triple deaths. I, I, I'm wondering this right at first. So, when I first, I thought it was a typo the first time I studied this. They said, we have deaths with 56 bits, and we have triple deaths with a strength of 112 bits. And I said, no, it should be three times 56, not two times 56. Why isn't it 150 something? 172 or something like that. And the answer is this. If you have triple deaths, you encrypt with key one, you decrypt with key two, and you encrypt with key three. Now you could in principle encrypt three times, but the reason it does encrypt, decrypt, encrypt is so it's easy for this device built in hardware to turn into single deaths for backward compatibility. All you have to do is feed it K1 equals K2 equals K3. And then it will encrypt with K1, decrypt with K1, and encrypt with K1 again. And that will cause your hardware triple desk device to easily have a mode that takes it down to single desk for backward compatibility. And that turned out to be fine because the problem is meet in the middle. If you consider two desks, which is what I would have thought, just do two rounds of desks with different keys, and then they'll be much stronger than single desks. And the answer is you're not much stronger at all. Because uh, instead of having to try a two to the 112 calculations, two to the 56 plus 56, you just have to do two separate two to the 56 calculations. So what you do is you, if you have a known plain text that goes to a cipher text, and all you know is the input and output, you can deduce this number in the middle, the hidden number in the middle, by just taking all possible um, key ones, which there's 256, and get a list of all the things that can be reduced in the middle, and then take the one on the end, run through decryption backwards, and get those two to the 56, and now you just have to compare those two lists of two to the 56 to find the number that matches, and you've deduced K1 and K2. So it only takes two to the 57 calculations to crack, not two to the 112. That's meet in the middle. Since you do not have one encryption operation, but you have something that can be broken in half, you can break one half of the process twice instead of breaking the whole process as one unified whole. And that's going to be the case with all these things with rounds. So it turns out that two rounds of DES is no better than one round. You have to have three rounds of DES to get the security of two rounds. If you have three, you can still do a meet in the middle attack, but there's only two meet in the middle attacks. One of them has two to 56 choices on the left and two to the 112 on the right. And the other has two to the 112 on the left and two to the 56 on the right. So in both cases, you have to do two to the 112 calculations. So this has 112 bits of security. Um, this is, there's a lot of problems like this. A similar problem is MD5 hashes came out that were um, uh, 128 bits long. And then SHA-1 bit caches came out that were 160 bits long. And some people said, for added security, I'll give you both the MD5 hash and the SHA-1 hash. And this turns out to do nothing at all. This takes you from 160 bits to 160.001 bits is all it does. It's not adding 56 more bits of security, not at all. This is like, you know, taking a screen with holes one inch apart and a screen with holes one millimeter apart and saying, well, now it's a better sieve than the one millimeter sieve. No, the, the wide one doesn't do anything. The narrow one does all the work. But it's the same kind of logic here. Anyway, so um, 
All right, and then there's the padding oracle, which you're totally going to do in the project, which is good, clean, fun. And for here, you just need a more detailed description. This is from Wikipedia, and I added some colors and stuff to it. So here's, if you have 40, if you're going to encrypt 47 bytes of plain text, you've got a block of 16, another block of 16, and you're missing one byte from the end. So you have to pad it with a number at the end. And as we know, you're going to put a 0, 1 there. That's the PKCS7. So here's the system. You feed in the initialization vector in blue, and you XOR it with the plain text. Then you encrypt it with the key. Then you take the output, and that's the IV for the next round. So you, let me uh, make it so I can sweep my mouse across this. All right. So you take this IV and XOR it with the plain text, encrypt. Then you take this output, and that's the IV for this. You XOR it with the plain text and encrypt. Then you take this output and use it for the IV, XOR it with the plain text and encrypt. And that red number is 0, 1 because it's padding and it's PKCS number seven padding. So that's the padding required. Um, so this yeah, is, go ahead. What do you mean by like the, the IV is public because it's, it's gonna be sitting in as a ciphertext anyway? Right, the IV is not a secret. Okay. But so the original IV you know, but you don't know the key. And you therefore, since you don't know the key, this output, although it's related to the IV, it's related in a way you can't figure out. So the IV is effectively unpredictable from that point on. And you don't know the key. That's the, that's the way it works. Yeah. All right. So now if, you're, if you just turn that upside down and see the decryption process, it goes like this. You take the ciphertext, you decrypt it, and then XOR with the IV to get back to the plain text. Then you take the ciphertext and use it as the IV for the next one. Now this is a scary operation. I take ciphertext, which the attacker knows, and I XOR it with something to produce the plain text. This is a simple reversible operation. So the plain text calculation here uses a number I have. That's the problem. You talked about the IV is unknown encrypting, but decrypting, you know all the IVs because you're using ciphertext for IVs. And that means the last byte here, that zero one that I know is XORed and related to this value here. This one byte here is related to that one byte of ciphertext here, which I'm gonna to use to the IV. And like I said, I knew when you have one block, depending on the previous block, this is dangerous. And indeed it is. So here's the game, here's the attack. I have ciphertext and I don't know the key. I change this byte. If I change this byte, what happens? This whole block is shot. The scrambling process causes this whole block to turn into random junk. So I do some collateral damage. But in this block, I only change the last byte because this ciphertext affects the next one just with a simple XOR. So if I change this byte, I change only one byte out here. And that means I can do a brute force attack. What I do is I try all two to the 56 values here and I look for that error message. And I will get a padding error except for two cases. One case is where I leave it at its original value and the message is okay. And the other one that does not give me a padding error is the one that puts a zero one right there. It has to be. So I can deduce this number, the orange number. And all I need to do is do 256 guesses and I learn one byte of that orange value. And after I do it, after I know that one, I can go back and guess this one 256 times, and then I know the next byte of that orange value, and I can keep it up until I know this entire orange value, even though I don't know the key. And what that means is, even though I don't have the key, I can perform a forgery attack. I can make these 16 bytes spell out any message I want, even though I don't have the key. And that means I can trick the person at the other end into thinking I do have the key when I don't. Send them ciphertext. I'll send them ciphertext, which when they decrypt will contain 16 bytes that say what I want it to say. But how would it say what you want to say if it has to be a, a byte that specifically changes it to? Well, you, this is the attack. By doing this attack, I deduce the orange values. And once I know the orange values, I can then adjust this to make this into anything I want. Oh, okay. And so I gain the ability to forge a message and it's a screwy message and a human would not be fooled by it because even though I can change these 16 bytes to anything I want, I had to accept collateral damage. These 16 bytes turned into garbage. So a human might notice that something is wrong with this message. But if I'm talking to a computer system at the other end, 
like a web server. Web servers routinely have messages that are like a URL, question mark, parameter equals value, parameter equals value, and they just look for parameter equals value and they ignore all the rest of it. So they don't even care that the 16 bytes before it were screwed up. As long as they see user ID equals zero, that makes you root. And they don't really know or care that something else happened because that was processed by some other layer of it. So that's what the systems that got broken with this technique are ones where you're sending up an encrypted message and they assume if they can decrypt it, that proves you're authorized. And then they look in there for certain things and they don't care that some other part of it is messed up, which is true of most web servers. And this is something in the 129S class we're talking about a lot. A lot of the web is several systems that only do part of the job. So they get some input from some other system and they don't worry about the part that's not their business. So the fact that some other part of it is broken doesn't mean that this part rejects the data or stops working. That's why, you know, it's, it's a, a cascade of disturbing things. If it was all humans reading it, that could notice when it looked funny, it would be fine. But the fact that it's computers means you can get away with murder this way. So is this a side attack? It is a, it is a um, side channel attack. Side channel. It is a side channel attack because you need that padding error message. And the original designer of AES planned for you to get the ciphertext and no other information. And if you get some other information, like an error message that tells you what was wrong with it, that turns out to be enough to ruin it. And, and the problem is, how could you possibly make any real system without making some design approximations like that, that seem so innocent? So that's, that's the important issue. And we'll go, you'll do that in great detail in the projects. Anyway, I got another Kahoot. Let's give that a shot. All right. They call that an existential forgery attack. We'll see a few of those. I didn't really find your message, but I was able to forge a message that tricked somebody else into thinking I had the key. So I didn't totally destroy the cryptography, but I did accomplish something that I was not supposed to be able to do. I think nine is the number. Wait a few more seconds. Ah, chat message comes in. All right. Can such an attack be done for ransom? Uh, well, um, I mean, where you demand money to make them stop, you could use any kind of attack, and you could use ransom to monetize it in principle. Um, this is the most common uh, padding oracle attacks I know were used to gain administrator privileges on servers, where they took the ability to send an encoded message as authentication. Yes, that's true. I mean, once you have control of the system, you could then uh, encrypt it and demand ransom. That would be a way to monetize it. You certainly could apply it to various things. Yep, right. All right. So let's try to start these and see how they go. All right. So what system exposes AES to timing attacks? Yes, the table-based system was the optimizing code, which took shortcuts and therefore exposed you to timing attacks. All right, which system is vulnerable to padding Oracle? CBC, of course, it comes from this weird system where the output of one block is used to encrypt the next block. That is the thing that makes it vulnerable. All right. Which one requires special processor instructions? Okay, that's the native implementation. Everyone got that? Okay. And which one leaves the penguin showing? That's how a Microsoft engineer described this. ECB, textbook encryption. All right. So 
which one converts AES into a stream cipher? That's counter mode, which is pretty awesome. Nobody uses it, but I think they should. They forgot to ask my opinion. All right, so uh, M Hinoj is in here twice, and WITB is in here twice, and I got Boop. Boop is going to have to tell me who they are if they want their points. I got a suspicion they might be the person also called Food and Stuff. That might be what this chat message is. Oh, oh, I was wrong about that. Okay, good. Well, now I've got your name. Thank you. Okay, good. So I have the names of people. All right. So uh, let me see if there's any announcements or anything. I'm just going to go up and help people. But um, where you are, oh, um, let's take a look at the projects and see where people are. Uh, 141. The projects are only loosely tied to the chapters, which is true most of my classes. A, one might possibly get upset about that if you're in the mood, but it is certainly the case that they're not terrible. But here's RSA. They're starting to do RSA. Some people have asked me questions about RSA with small keys and so on. Um, one person was having trouble with the short RS cracking these short RSA keys. Um, the RSA attacks here rely upon using two prime numbers that are too similar. And so you have to give the square root, and you're going to have to um, use a high precision square root for these things. So there are Python libraries to give you high precision. And another thing I don't know if I put in the project, but a thing worth knowing is Wolfram Alpha. Wolfram is a mathematician, and he made a website sort of like Google for math, where you can do things. And you can do like high precision math on here. You can do the square root of a number that's like 30 or 40 digits long, and it will get it with great precision. It does not handle really big things like, of course, 1,000-bit keys, but it does handle a lot of things, and it's an alternative to using a high-precision Python library for some of the projects. Yes, if you import the right library, like a decimal library, then that's, what, that's a good thing to do. And we, the projects show you some ways to do that. So uh, we're down here. We're in four, four, five, and six. I just want to see where we are. That's all RSA. Then you set up an Ubuntu server which we'll use uh, later. And um, yeah, that's right, to set up some blockchains. That's why we're using that server. All right, so let me uh, see how people are saying. Is there a workaround if Gimpy isn't installing? Ah, um, did it not install on Kali? I installed it on the Mac. On the Mac it installed. Oh, okay. Ran his on the Mac. Um, this a couple of things you have to install. Well, let me see if it goes on um, Kali. Here's a Kali that's pretty modern. It's not the very latest one from yesterday, but it's the one before it. And let me see. Good. Uh, you used Gimpy for what? Which one is that? Number four or five, probably. Short keys or Let's see. It was 5A. Thank you. Good. Let me try my 5A here on my Kali and see if I can find a workaround. Um, I think I did this stuff on the Mac originally. And let me see if I'm okay. So here you need to import math, and where's the Gimpy? Um, here, F G M P Y. Okay, there's Gimpy. Good. So you have to install Gimpy on the Mac and on Kali, right? So theoretically, you can do this. Let's see if it works though, because they do keep changing things. All right. So I'll just use this form of Kali right now if I can stand it. I can't stand it. Okay. Uh, one forty-seven. Uh, okay, one seventy-two. 17, 0, that's Docker. Okay, 147, let's see if I can connect with SSH. Okay, exit, SSH, root at 147, 124, 212, 134. Okay, good. Okay, so now I'm in Kali. And now I can try some of these things. So let's do, um, what happens if we do that apt install Python Gimpy? Oh, it looks like it's finding it. Let's see if it works. Okay, because I, I hoped Kali would be the general universal workaround, because you need Kali for most of my classes. And uh, 
if things weren't on collie, that's the simplest answer. So I thought, oh, is this hogwash? Microcode, okay. Well, let's see if that worked. Oh, because I had Docker, okay. Which you probably won't have, it doesn't matter. Once you got Gimpy, then um, let's see if this works. Python, and let's see if I can do this jazz here. Okay. And I didn't, fin should have come from up here. So there, fin, it's P minus Q, okay. Okay, let me get these things running. Here's P and Q. Okay, and here's fin. Wait a minute, what happened here? Q, oh, I didn't have N, all right, all right. Sorry, I'm jumping too fast. Let's get N, which is here, okay. All right, so let me just work through this one. Now that I've got all this stuff, so I'm gonna leave Python and come back in. This won't take long, and it'll be good to go through it in an organized way. So if I start Python and use Python 2.7, then import math, and do the normal square root, I get this 1,007, 11, 4, 16, and that is not right. Um, so to get more decimal places, um, right, so one of the prime numbers, well, let's see. I can get more decimal places the, uh, with repr. The better position part of my computer C, you scroll down. Yeah, I'm trying to see how to use my repper is part of what? You keep going down. It's when you are solving not A, but you give a bigger key. Yeah, all right. Anyway, so A you can do with this kind of key. Anyway, I wanted to get down to Gimpy. Uh, let me see if I can get, right. So um, if we, yeah, I think I can. So let's import Gimpy. And I can, so I think it's all going to work. So let me just see if I can go through these steps. So I've um, done the square root, all right. And this will show me more places. Now I can do this, and I can find um, something that factors it. Because when n percent i is zero, then i is a factor. This means n modulus i is zero, so this is either p or q. That number provides it. So uh, I can set, for example, p equal to that, and q will equal n over p. And if I print p, q, I can see p here and q there, and I have got them in standard order where p is smaller. But I'm called, I might have gotten the backwards. So let's see here. He, okay, I'll give it a try and call. Yeah, call is the simplest answer. And let me see if there's anything else we're mentioning here. But now that Gimpy is in there, I think I'll be able to do even larger things. And so here we are encrypting a message and so on. And so here, um, yeah, I think that's enough. So that's the point. Just use Kali if your solar system is not working. Yeah. Um, just to remind everyone to scan downward from the, uh, from the square rooms, not iterate, not iterate upwards. It'll take forever if you try to go from zero to the root. Uh, oh, of course. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, in case anybody's going to, you don't want to try all possible keys. The, the solution to this, which is true of a lot of CTF problems, is you have P and Q that are similar. And so you start at the square root and go either up or down from that. Don't start at zero. If you're looking for numbers. If P and Q are similar, then they're both close to the square root. And this is a mistake you see in academic exercises. In real world RSA, this is almost never the case because you just separately choose random numbers P and Q. And uh, for any given N, yeah. there's only one pair of P and Q? That's right. There's okay. only one pair. Of, in fact, because you, your number, N has to be the product of just two primes and no more. If it isn't, then the whole logic bar say will fail. And that turns out to be very difficult. And we'll get there. But one thing is there's no known way to generate prime numbers. So what you do is you generate random numbers, and prime numbers are actually not that rare. So you generate random numbers, and then there's a test which tells you if it's not prime with a 50% chance. So you run that test 100 times, 
And then you figure it's more pretty much likely to be prime. So you guess random numbers and you know prove which ones are not prime. And the one that survived, you would assume it's prime and use it. And then you encrypt a message and decrypt it to see if it worked. And then you say, well, it's good enough. This is kind of nuts, but that's the way it is. And there's a better test, by the way, for primality, we'll get there, which has like a 90% chance of detecting ones that are not prime. But it turns out to have terrifying weaknesses. There are whole categories of numbers that will pass that test and not be prime. Anyway, um, in practice, these are all small issues because they're small number percentages. If you can start with random numbers, it's pretty easy to find the prime numbers. But that's why it takes so long to generate our RSA keys. It really has to do a ridiculous amount of calculation to generate them. It has to hunt for a prime number with random numbers and then hunt for another one, then multiply them together. It's kind of a lot of math. That's why RSA is like a thousand times slower than AES. This is why private key encryption is so popular. You can't do RSA at line speed at all. Anyway, yeah. So why isn't there like a central server with you know, billions of times that any server could connect to down with like a million of them and then select from those? Kind of well, that, that's, that wouldn't be safe because then you'd only have a million possibilities and that's nothing. The whole, the whole security relies on there being this you know, unthinkable number of possibilities like 10 to the 100. Uh, but, okay, let's say then the, the, the server is able to have known primes, all known primes, you connect to it, but then the server downloads, let's say, a million of those yeah. at the beginning just to have a, a selection, yeah. a random selection ahead of time, and they know for 100% that these are, that these are primes. Now, would that, wouldn't that get rid of the computational overhead as well as guarantee that the primes take one well, see, randomly among your tables? Well, see, it would, except there's no way for that server to find out they're perfectly prime either. There's no known way to do it. And so it turned, and of course, the real point to breach security is you want everything to be done on your machine. You don't want to trust anybody else. That's the whole logic here. Sort of like blockchain. You want to, if possible, you'd like to have a system where you don't have to trust anybody else's list of anything. And these crypto systems we're using do have that property. Um, you could design a different kind of crypto system where you must trust a central authority. And there's a lot of people that want to do that so the government can maintain control of everything. And there's, in fact, um, something that comes up every couple of years in Congress in America is a key escrow law. It's taken so seriously about two decades ago that Microsoft built into their domain controllers key escrow functionality that you can turn on. They're, they seriously thought there was going to be a law passed requiring that the government has a copy of everybody's key all the time. And they built it in their system that will keep sending the key up to the server if you turn that on. But they never had to turn it on because that law didn't pass. But a lot of people want that law. And in other countries like United Arab Emirates, they have that law. So when BlackBerry put their encrypted phones in the country and they were encrypted through servers in Canada, United Arab Emirates said, you cannot sell your Blackberries here unless you put a server in the UAE so we have the keys. And they did that. So if you're United Arab Emirates, your phone numbers go through the local server, which has the key, which then decrypts them and the government can examine it and then it forwards it on to Canada. And um, that's their law. So their technology does allow that. But, um, and if you didn't allow that, you couldn't sell the phones there. But America doesn't have that law yet, although many people want it. And we may, if we had like another terrorist attack, that law might pass. Anyway, so uh, it's, the system you're proposing is, is a lot of people do in fact want that system, but currently the cryptographers are the privacy advocates and they very much want a system that does not have that property where you don't get anything from anybody else. You do it all right here so nobody can steal it, or so they would like to believe. Anyway, good. Any other questions? All right, well, I'm going to stop the recording, go upstairs and see what's happening up there. Uh, tomorrow in the 128 class, I'm going to have a special non-recorded event where I will show some vulnerabilities that it must be kept secret for a while yet, but some pretty exciting stuff. So if you can attend physically, you might enjoy that. Now, I will have people required to sign a non-disclosure agreement to see it, though, because I really don't want people leaking it out or we'll all be in trouble. Anyway.